crashing noises around here, and we don't want to create another road. So she goes there. southerly direction so that's basically where she's looking now and I think he's getting further and further away and she is now of course well out of her territory so perhaps her Easter cycle coming to an end and I hope that she will then head back east towards Juma she may still be looking for him you know she'll be in that kind of um, closing off period of the Easter's Did you see him? Mm -mm. He's just dead, dead ahead there. There now seem to be four people in the sighting, which is not ideal. I'm just going to hang back here. It was two sightings, of course, and so now they're coming back together becomes one sighting. And suddenly they're four vehicles. And what we don't want to do is overpressure the animals.
cheese. Now, Jennifer in Toronto, you were making reference to a statement I made that got me into a lot of trouble. Um, I referred to Karula when I first met her as slightly pug-nosed. Um, now, this was misinterpreted as my saying she's not very attractive. I do think she's attractive. I'm afraid, Jennifer, though, I do think that she and her daughter are slightly, um, well, they've got slightly shorter noses than some of the other leopards I've known in my time. That doesn't mean that they're not attractive or um, any less magnificent than, uh, than they absolutely are. And she's quite stunning. And anybody who didn't think that she was stunning would uh, have to have their head read, I think. around here somewhere. yesterday very effectively and rather amusingly is the problem might be with Tingana. He's been seen mating with Batile, with Shadow and with, um, with Karula. None of them have fallen pregnant. So perhaps um, not to put too fine a point on it, old Tingana is firing blanks. Uh, so it could, could well be that Tingana is the issue. And the 11 it's getting on, but it's not certainly not too old. And I think the oldest, certainly the oldest that I know of, that's had cubs. There we go. There it is. The oldest I know of uh, is probably about 13 or 14. In fact, 15. At Londolozi, uh, had cubs when she was 15 years old. She's quite a pale leopard. Not a sort of golden colour like a uh, quatile. And then, uh, as is as is common around here, uh, well, this is the kind of standard issue coloration for leopard. Some are a little bit golder, some are a little bit paler. Uh, there's no judgment on which is more beautiful, just in case anybody thinks I'm passing judgment on her obvious magnificence. Um, and Millie, in Utah, you want to know, um, do we get black leopards here? Millie, we don't get black leopards in this particular area. That's not to say they couldn't occur here. And apparently, uh, there is one around at the Leidenberg area, which you'll have to look on a map for. It's just up near, uh, it's on the High Felt, so probably about two or 300 kilometers from here. There are reports of a black leopard there, but they really are not common at all. And really the most place that they would be the most successful would be in very forested areas. Here, they would probably be at a slight disadvantage compared with these leopards. So you may well find them in areas like the Congo, um, where those forests are very thick, and it's quite possible that they exist there. And because there's not a lot in the way of research or this sort of tourist operation, they probably go unnoticed. And you may also find them in India, and certainly leopards spread all the way from Africa into the Russian Far East, same species of leopard. And that 
character, a wonderful character from Rudyard Kipling's jungle book called Bagheera. A black le- there's a black leopard and or melanistic leopard. Same species as this, just very dark, lots of melanin. And they would occur possibly more in India than they do here because, again, there's a lot more in the way of forest. So out here, this kind of color that lovely Karuda is there is more appropriate, I think, for the sort of um, for the for the habitat. And that kind of, the light is more dappled by the woodland. It's not quite dark, and where a black leopard might have more an advantage in a forest. So, really, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> for a little while and see if she doesn't carry on following him. And if she does, uh, then, we'll, then we'll follow her. Otherwise, we'll go and have a look at the male just now. Uh, no, he's no one. We're right on the edge of our traversing the road, and Tindana has just crossed over it going to the south. So we're going to have to stay here. Karula, what a terrible trial that's going to be. David in the United, from the United Kingdom, currently in the Philippines, being battered by a typhoon in a hotel room. David, I'm so glad that you are able to draw some kind of peace uh, and um, possibly warmth from what you're seeing here. Uh, that is a wonderful update. Thank you for sending us through your message and telling us where you are. It really is wonderful to hear things like that, that people all the way over the world are enjoying the wonders African wilderness uh, in their hotel rooms, in their homes, and sometimes in their hospital beds. It really is marvelous. I'm just going to try and get a better look here. question from Eye of the Tiger. Uh, I love that Twitter handle. Um, Eye of the Tiger, you want to know what happens if the two sightings become one, who decides um, who goes and how is it decided? Normally, Eye of the Tiger, we have pistols at dawn and uh, the victor will, will, will remain in the sighting. Now, it's, it's normally pretty friendly. People are so dependent on each other out here that unless it's a truly spectacular sighting uh, that we really don't think there'll be space at again moving out and they kind of fall over each other to to be good about it and so yeah i mean in the case of that you saw that we eventually were four vehicles in the sighting uh, i i hung back briefly and just asked and immediately somebody moved out he'd been here longer than some of the others and that's basically how it is i was quickly going to check on the map what's going on Yeah, the mail has now gone south. 
take him to a place called Shirley's. Basically, he's heading towards Londolozi to go and have his breakfast there, so he's out of our traversing area. And she's definitely coming up at Easter cycle now. Wonderful comments, one from Chris Rogue, who says, says it's, it's tough being a stud uh, to Ghana. It absolutely is, Chris. You know, he is. He, he seems to be doing a lot of work around here, uh, male-wise, and Vula has been pretty much absent in Karula's life for the last little while, and um, certainly he's had to he's had to do his business with Quatile and Shadow. But I mean, I think that's pretty much. Those are the three females in his territory. And then a lovely one from Kachino, John, perhaps you say he, he was afraid of commitment and that's why he's now heading at a great speed towards the south. Um, John, I think the less I say about that, the better, but a wonderful comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Just like your house cat cleaning herself in the morning. A little bit warmer than it was yesterday, but still a big cloud overhead, quite thick. And apparently, I'm told by the ind indefatigable Brian that there is a cyclone system off the coast of Mozambique, and that's probably where this cloud is coming from. That's right, Brian? Mm hmm. Now, the one thing about this leopard, again, that is probably going to get me into trouble is that she does have quite a saggy belly. That's not saying she's ugly, don't worry. But she does have a quite um, saggy belly, which means that I have certainly confused her for being pregnant before, and I know three or four other people who've looked at her. I know Peter, when he was here, had a look and said he thought she looked pretty pregnant. And then and I agreed with him, and the next day, of course, she found Tingana and uh, tried extremely hard to convince him to mate with her. She eventually succeeded, and then for the next five days, six days, this is day six, I think, uh, they were mating. And he has taken fright and is now hitting very fast for uh, some, some rejuvenating rest, possibly at Londolozi. Karula, I think, will make her way back to the east from here, out of Shadow's territory. She's actually, you know what, she's actually right on the course of a corner or border of Shadow and Quatile's territory. So Quatile might be around here as well. And Quatile, as far as I'm aware, maybe very distantly, but certainly not closely. So that meeting would be quite an interesting one. question from Boyd in North Carolina and it's, I think it comes from a common misconception because so many of the pictures that we get of leopards are of them uh, sitting in trees. Now Boyd, you want to know if they sleep predominantly on the ground or on the, in trees. Boyd, they're not um, arboreal, i.e. they don't spend most of their time in trees. The reason leopards get into trees is because they like to hide their food there, and yes, it is certainly safer, and sometimes they will sleep in trees or rest up there if they're feeling a little unsafe, but by, by far, um, they will spend most of their time on the ground, and they do that because it's simply more comfortable. And remember, once you're in a tree, if a potential threat comes along to the base of the tree, you can't really go anywhere. And it's quite interesting, if you as a human being walk up to a tree where a leopard is sleeping and they see you, they will normally spot you from a mile off, of course, and then the first thing they do is come down the tree. They don't try and sort of hide up there and see if you'll come up. Uh, so the only way, they climb up trees to get away from things like hyena, but as soon as they do actually feel pretty vulnerable there. <laughs> and a very 
Vicky. <laughs> Good point. From Vicky, who says <laughs> that uh, if I had had nine cubs, my belly would also be sagging. I think that's a very good point, Vicky. Um, <laughs> yes, I am sorry. I hope I haven't created further offence by describing dear Karula's belly as a saggy. <laughs> I'm just going to get a quick update on the radio to see if anybody's trying to get here. Must be gentlemanly about letting people in and out of these sightings. Sorry about what happened. I'm totally stationary. That's probably something to do with the barometric pressure or the cloud or the trees or perhaps even aliens. Who knows? But we're back. Uh, nobody else is coming to the sighting, so we have it all to ourselves, which is marvellous. from Ellen to try and move the vehicles just to see if we can't see her face better. Just to see if we can't see her face better. Ellen, um, the, the, cl the clearest view is going to be from behind her, which isn't going to result in us seeing her face. I can try and sneak a little bit forward. We'll see if we'll get a better view from there. Uh, but there's quite a lot of bush basically in front of her face. Have a go. There's also quite a lot of bush that I will possibly run over. Well, let's see. in Long Island, New York, it's your question, and I think I understand it correctly. Um, might, you know, separated by a few years that come together, I think is, is the question, if I understand it correctly. Um, sometimes they do. What would it might happen, and certainly Scott has made mention of the fact that he's seen this a few times, that a female will have a cub, and then that cub will go almost to independence, or so be say a male of two years, and she'll mate again, and have more cubs. And that youngster from a previous litter may then kind of hang around for a while and meet up with the family now and again until he becomes he or she become terri becomes territorial at age probably four or five. So yes, absolutely, it's possible. I'm afraid her, she's put her face behind another bush. 
and I definitely can't move from where I am now, I'm afraid. There we go. is exploding in my ear. They're all following Tingana now, of course. You can see her belly is full. That's not, of course, because she's pregnant. That's because she's eaten half a buffalo. And yesterday, in case you didn't see yesterday, Shadow and Tingana managed to, not Shadow, Karula and Tingana managed to kill a young buffalo very unusual for leopards to eat a buffalo. Uh, I suspect that they probably both killed him. Uh, very cooperative hunting. A young buffalo, probably less than six months old, but still much heavier than both of them. So really impressive uh, killing feat that they managed to pull off. Look at there. There you go, Ellen. Christy, you want to know if some sort of form of dinner came by here, would she have the energy to hunt it? Uh, Christy, absolutely she would. They um, are not uh, afraid of keeping pantries full of food, so sometimes they'll kill multiple things and leave them stashed in trees about the place. So she would definitely have, say, a diker walked past here and unaware. There's no reason on earth that she wouldn't kill it. She'd definitely got the energy to do it. Uh, she's... They always look like they're a little bit tired, but I mean, that's a, almost exactly like a house cat. Now, apparently, it says wow across the front of her. Wow. Um, loyal viewers have pointed out, and I am staring at her forehead, and somebody pointed out how that was possible. They sent through a screenshot a little while back and it, it's definitely there but I forgot. I can't see it anymore so if, next time she sticks her head up I'd much appreciate it if one of you would take a screenshot and show me where the wow is written because I'm failing to see it again. It's a bit frustrating. It is very obvious once you, once you know what you're looking for but <laughs> I just cannot see it. Fastidious cleaners have to be fastidious cleaners, and I think that one of the main reasons they clean each other like they do is because what happens is I think it reduces their smell. I'll get back to what I'm saying just now. Shannon in Ohio, uh, you want to know would she mate if she was, would she still mate if she was pregnant? Shannon, no, she wouldn't. These animals do not mate unless they are in heat or in estrus. Um, so no, she wouldn't, she wouldn't mate if she was uh, if she was pregnant. I'll just I'll explain what I mean there now, and it's quite an interesting discussion around mammal behaviour and why that is, and things around advertised estrus and non-advertised estrus. So, I'm just hearing the car coming. Anyway, um, when I say that they're fastidious cleaners and they try and they want to reduce their smell, I think one of the reasons that the cats are such fastidious cleaners of themselves and each other is that they would like to, as much as possible, reduce the smell of, say, carrion or 
rather obvious sort of cat smell when they're walking through the bush because I think what it does is alert their prey to their presence and so probably plays a large role in disease reduction as well but I think it probably reduces their, their smell. Now let's just get on to that very interesting question from Sharon. Why don't they mate when they're pregnant? The more interesting question is why do some animals who are pregnant mate? And it has just about everything to do with this concept of infanticide, which is a major, major part of mammal behavior. And certainly throughout mammals' evolution, many, many mammal species do engage in infanticide, and certainly the closest ones to us are the bonobos or the um, pygmy chimpanzee. And what they do is they mate every day with everyone. So the females will mate with everyone. There's uh, lots of evidence of homosexual behavior, and so there's lots of mating going on. And what that does is that nobody knows whose father uh, is to who, who is whose father, and completely reduces infanticide. Because what happens with infanticide is that non-related males will often kill babies to induce females to come into estrus. So that's the one end of the scale. The other end of the scale from the primate world would be the gibbons, and they are almost entirely monogamous. And what happens with a gibbon is that, and much the same as with a leopard, is that when the, they will mate when the female comes into estrus, and then they won't mate anymore. And she will advertise when she's in estrus, just like a female like this does. Now, in, so it's one strategy, that's one of the strategies. And we don't know with leopards yet, but what happens is she may well mate, she hasn't this time round, but leopard females do mate with multiple males uh, during estrus cycles. And we think that that may have something to do with confusing p paternity, so that in order to reduce infanticide. And uh, human beings are another wonderful example of animals that don't advertise estrus. Uh, so humans will mate whenever. Uh, they don't have. They don't always. They're not always capable of um, conceiving during mating. Uh, uh, there are a number of porcupines do the same sort of thing. Bonobos do the same sort of thing. Most animals. that we know of ad advertise the estrus just like a leopard does. And outside of that period, they don't mate at all. So Sharon, a very interesting question. Thank you for that. one from Cynthia. So we've spoken a little bit about perhaps Tingana's inability to produce viable offspring. I mean, that's be probably being a little bit rough. He has he has sired some cubs, uh, not least of which is magnificent little Cindida, who we hope to see back here fairly soon. Um, Cynthia, you want to know, would, say, Karula and the other females that he's been mating with if they don't fall pregnant, would they kind of move on and find another male? Or would they choose to? I, I don't know, Cynthia. I, I think it's possible, certainly. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that they would draw the logical conclusion that, you know, they're coming into estrus mating for five days and they're not falling pregnant and then necessarily logically assign that to a def um, some kind of defect in Tingana. And I'm not saying that there is one, uh, but let's say that there was for the sake of example, for the sake of an example um, but would they she, you see they, they, they do mate with multiple males anyway uh, especially if they're close by their other territories so would they choose to do it I would say probably not um, would they do it yes absolutely they would I would say that they wouldn't necessarily be able to make the conclusion uh, physiologically or otherwise that um, the male they were mating with was not doing his job to the best of his ability, perhaps. Very good question. So I think if she was closer to Mbula's territory, which is further east of here, or closer to Anderson's territory, which is further west of here, I think there were, she may well have moved off halfway through her Easter cycle to go and mate with one of them. 
but because she really is squarely in the middle of Tingana's territory here, she wouldn't have come across another male. one from Raisa again I'm constantly stimulated by the questions we get here um, you want to know if Tingana is as we have said firing blanks would it affect his ability to maintain dominance here no Raisa I don't think it would make any difference whatsoever um, you know you know the females possibly might reject mating with him or seek out other males. Possibly, I don't think they would, but it's possible. But his ability to be dominant is predicated purely by his size. Um, and his size is predicated by how much he has to eat. Also, I suppose his levels of aggression, which would come from his testosterone levels. And they may kind of, may be a predictor of whether or not he's able to produce offspring or not. But I think testosterone uh, probably, if, if, if he has a problem, again, would be talking purely hypothetically here. If he has a problem, I don't think it's a testosterone issue. It might be some other kind of disease, uh, but certainly he's very big, or he's not very big. He's a good-sized male leopard. He's in his prime, so I don't think it would affect his ability to hold his territory at all. Very nice question. She's sleeping pretty soundly, and given that she's not even in her territory, I'm, I'm interested that she's sleeping so completely soundly. the car. This is going to be high entertainment for you. Uh, Brent Leo Smith, who broke Jigger today, uh, I know he probably didn't do it intentionally. I'm definitely going to accuse him of it, though, when I see him next. Um, he's being towed home, so I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to hand you across to him. We'll try and get another view, and uh, enjoy your little cameo with Brent, and his, uh, he's being towed back by Eugene. See you just now. Without the electrics. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you can see, we are being towed. Right. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes very strange things happen with these vehicles. And uh, mechanically, I can generally figure out what's wrong. Uh, but this is an electrical problem. It's like we had a, an anti-thievery device that just turned off the whole car while we were driving. So we've disconnected the battery. We've got to leave it disconnected for a while. And hopefully it comes back to life. I'm very confused at the moment. And Eugene has come to rescue us. And he's towing us back to camp. And <laughs> it is a, definitely not where I was planning to be this morning. Sorry about that. Hopefully we'll have it up and running as soon as possible. Andrew is sitting behind me giggling like a small child. He thinks this is highly amusing. Fortunately, we've got a brand new tow rope. There we go. Eugene, we're going next right. There you go, you can hear Angle, uh, Andrew cackling behind us. Now, it's actually not the easiest thing to be the vehicle being towed. Uh, unfortunately, we're about to be towed down a bad signal area. So 
you might lose us, but I'm quite sure you'd much prefer to spend more time with James and Karuda than us eating diesel fumes from the other vehicle. I just said, I'm sure you'd much rather be with James and Karula uh, than with us eating diesel fumes. High action here, everybody. Karula has blinked. So I think what we'll do is we'll sit with her a little bit longer. Send through your questions if you'd like to. We'll chat about her for a bit longer and anything that you want to ask about the leopard dynamics, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And then I think we'll move on and see what else we might be able to find. Uh, we are obviously alone now because Brent, Leo Smith and Jigger are out of service. <laughs> close to her now, we're probably less than three meters away, and she is sleeping completely soundly. And Ashley in North Carolina would want to know, would she allow us to be this close if she had a cub? She would, because she's not, she does not associate this vehicle with any form of threat, and you can see that by the fact that she's basically fast asleep. And she will, you know, she will become slightly more protective when she has a cub, but uh, no, as long as she doesn't feel threatened, she won't feel that the cub is threatened. So she wouldn't be very confiding with cubs. And her cubs would then take on that kind of relaxed attitude to vehicles and people. And certainly that was the case with her last two, Quinuma and Quati uh, Quarantine. Uh, they were magnificent little male leopards who were totally confiding around the vehicle. Except, well, one of them grew up a little bit angry with cars, and that was Konuma. He tended to be a little bit more irascible around vehicles, but certainly quarantined. He could always drive over his tail before he'd notice you. And they just got that attitude from their mother. They grew up around cars. She didn't react adversely to them, and so nor did they. Texas. Uh, we're sitting here, of course, three meters from a fearsome predator of Africa. And so the question has to be, is there any danger? Is there some kind of, uh, is there a precedent or are there records of cat cyclists moving onto vehicles and causing a problem? Um, Dave, there are one or two. I was involved in one once, but that was an abhorrent situation where a leopard was being harassed by some wild dogs and a young male, very much like Konuma, actually had a very similar attitude to vehicles. He actually leapt onto the bonnet of my car. He, he, he was basically taking his frustration out on, on the vehicle. He saw us as a threat, and thankfully the tracker was in the back seat. He wasn't on the front, otherwise he'd have been in big trouble. And Dave, it happened so fast that there's nothing you can do. I mean, I had a rifle on the vehicle with me, as I had guests. But, I mean, there was absolutely no ways that I could have got the rifle off the rifle rack and loaded it uh, by the time into the kind of, kind of cab with the people there. There was no, absolutely no way I could have done anything about it with the rifle. So they really are very fast indeed. Um, as it turns out, he climbed off the car and, and went away eventually. 
So it's very unusual. It does happen. Certainly in East Africa, you have those pictures with lions and, well, cheetahs certainly sometimes lions, sitting on the top of, of uh, safari cars as they're sort of staring out over the plains. They use them like they do termite mounds for vantage points. And so that does happen every so often. But, you know, they just don't associate the vehicles with um, a threat. And because of that, they don't see us. A threat or as a meal. Because of that, they don't kind of find any reason to leap onto the cars, thankfully. Not very nice having a leopard sitting next to you. Good question, Dave. The same goes with the lions. They just don't see us as a threat or as a prey species. Very different on foot, of course. She's sleeping extremely soundly for a leopard. <laughs> heads up quite often and she's not doing any of that. And another question from Boyd in North Carolina. Boyd? A hyena or a lion? Boyd, they could possibly. I think, you know, if you were to have, it depends on the distance. I think you'd find that over, say, hmm, 30 meters, 20 meters, a leopard would be faster than both of them. Over 100 meters, I think you'd probably find a lion would start with its huge strides, would start to catch up with a leopard. And I think over, say, 400 meters, a hyena would probably beat both of them because it's just got a lot more stamina. So that's how I think it would go. I think you'll find over a very short distance, a leopard's explosive speed would be much quicker than the other two. A lion is pretty explosive, but it's obviously carrying a lot more weight, and so uh, they're very fast top-end speed, and they are pretty explosive, but not perhaps as fast as these. Hyena, not nearly as explosively fast, but they will run, I mean, certainly much faster than human beings, and they can, can maintain that for quite a long time. So I think that's probably the accurate answer, Boyd. Cats Joe and Sherry want to know about rela relations sort of between leopards and house cats. Uh, do they get hairballs? First of all, Sherry, they don't get hairballs as far as I realize. Um, but they absolutely do sleep as much as house cats do, Joe. Um, I think they do get sort of hairballs, Sherry. I've seen them certainly coughing up bits and pieces now and then. Um, whether they get them as much as house cats or not, I don't think so. But they, they probably do. I mean, you saw her licking that very long fur on her belly. So I'm so sure she is swallowing quite a lot of hair. Um, and Joe, do they purr? That's actually quite an interesting question. They don't purr. Um, cheetahs purr, but these these leopards don't. Their vocal cords are very different from the other cats, and when they're purring, uh, it's much more of a growl, uh, and it's a lot more sort of blood curdling than the gentle purr of your house cat. But cheetah definitely purr, and that's wonderful to hear. It's quite a lot louder than your house cat, uh, but it is it is wonderful to hear. I'm just going to get a quick update on the radio. Sorry about 
about that, everybody. Again, inexplicable to somebody of my pay grade um, or intelligence. So there is another leopard just close by with a cub called Salayeshe, who I have yet to see. Unfortunately, and she's really close, uh, unfortunately she is just off the traversing area that we're allowed onto. So that is a deep and abiding irritation. So unfortunately we won't be able to go and see her. But definitely a very healthy leopard population around here. So she's actually on the corner of three territories now. She's in, she's in shadows, but on the corner of Salayeshe and uh, Quatiles. And I don't know what her, perhaps some of, someone can tell me what her relation to, relationship is with Salayeshe. Do you have any idea, Brian? Mm -hmm. um, I have never seen Salayeshe. And so perhaps if some of you have, you might tell me what her relationship is with Salayeshe. I don't know that they are related. Certainly she's not related closely to Quatile, who is not far from here. Her territory is now completely vacant. I think she'll probably head back there during the course of the next day or so. Does a leopard get lighter as it gets older? Sheila, it does normally, you know. Uh, certainly the oldest leopards that I've seen are much paler than the young ones in their prime. And I think yeah, you will definitely find that she will get lighter. She's quite a light leopard anyway, but I think you'll find that she will get lighter and lighter as she gets older. Certainly the, when the three, four female, who's the oldest female I've ever seen, when she was 17 when I last saw her, um, when she died, uh, she was almost white. Well, she was very, very pale indeed. All of that yellow color kind of goes, that, that golden color that you can see there tends to go a much sort of paler, mm, sort of mm, a creamed honey color. So they do lose the golden sheen. Yeah. 